Hello and welcome to The Pitch, brought to you by Livewire Markets. I'm Ali Selby and today we're joined by Newberger Berman's Gabrielle Ong for a deep dive into the impacts of sticky inflation and higher rates on private markets. Thanks so much for joining us today, Gabriel. It's awesome to have you here in Sydney. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ali. It's a pleasure to be here. As you may have guessed from the intro, inflation has obviously proved to be stickier than we thought. Interest rates are now likely to stay higher for longer. How does that impact your outlook for the private equity market? You know, I think it's been a challenge uh, because if you look back at the last seven to 10 years, uh, a lot of the returns uh, have been fueled by attractive borrowing rates. And, you know, we don't expect that contributor of return to persist uh, going forward, at least in a less meaningful way. And it's also been a challenge where the broadly syndicated loan markets have retreated. And we've seen that in a meaningful way throughout 2022 and some parts of 2023. Um, but what that has given rise to is the opportunity for private credit funds to step in to fill the void that the banks have left behind. So we do see private credit funds providing the financing to still enable some of these uh, transactions to materialize and to take place. And we do see the banks actually coming back. So we see a bit of a recovery in the broadly syndicated loan market. Um, so hopefully that bodes well going forward. Uh, but as sponsors think about underwriting transactions, um, they need to look at other levers to drive returns besides financial leverage. How is private equity underwriting their transactions right now? That's a great segue into this question. Um, you know, I would broadly break down the contributors of returns into three different buckets. Number one, it's really revenue growth and profit increase. Number two, it would be multiple expansion. So if a general partner or fund buys into a company at a certain multiple, uh, they would aim to reposition the business and sell it at a high multiple. And the third contributor of return would really be uh, debt or financial leverage. Our observation is the latter two um, is going to play a smaller part in driving the returns on a go-forward basis, simply because of the higher rates environment, as well as the trickier exit market. Uh, so it's really back to basics. It's back to revenue and profit growth, um, dr really driving the returns that private equity funds are underwriting to. And we see that from a very practical perspective. Um, and just to give an example, in the last 10 co-investments or the last 10 direct deals that we've done, as we broke down that bridge uh, or returns decomposition, the vast majority of the returns that GPs were underwriting to came from revenue and profit growth. So uh, we're still underwriting to the same returns, but the breakdown of it um, has changed from where it was you know, seven to 10 years ago when rates were low and you know, macro was a bit more accommodative. Okay, with all that in mind, which sectors are private equity firms turning towards and which are they avoiding? I would say that, you know, there has been a pivot towards more resilient and defensive sectors. And the good news is that there are multiple of them uh, and a large opportunity to go after. So some, just to mention a few sectors that we like, uh, we like the software space, right? So these are software providers providing mission critical um, products to companies. And these are typically um, on a subscription basis. So there's very high visibility of revenue and cash flows and an asset light business and very cash generative. So software and technology is a space that we like. Uh, the second area is healthcare, right? I think what the COVID pandemic has really emphasized is the importance of healthcare and wellness. And a lot of people, you know, uh, and a lot of consumers out there are paying a lot more attention. And particularly in some markets where public healthcare systems have been stressed, uh, there is a great reliance on the private healthcare system to step in to fill the gaps. And that's where we see private capital uh, coming in to, to make some investments in that space. And just to mention another example, I think we like the consumer non-discretionary space. So an all-weather type product uh, that continues to sell, whether it's in a bull market or bear market. Uh, so we like these defensive um, products that you know, are, are highly resilient. So some of these sectors are, are the typical ones that GPs have been investing into and where we see the deal flow um, in more recent months. Mm. And on uh, the other side of that, which sectors are you are kind of not receiving a lot of capital right now? Yeah, I think some sectors that we tend to avoid, not to say that they're good or bad, but I think it's just you know, harder, harder to underwrite those risks. So we tend to shy away from energy uh, commodity and oil and gas type sectors uh, simply because um, there are many market elements that are beyond uh, the control of the general partner uh, to influence. So we've typically shied away from that. Uh, we've also stayed away from capex intensive as well as highly cyclical sectors like consumer discretionary. 
you know, when, you know, uh, in sort of softer macro environments, you know, uh, consumers tend to just pull back on spending in those areas and those businesses tend to, you know, disproportionately suffer. Uh, so these are just some sectors that we're sort of, uh, I wouldn't say avoiding completely, but just, you know, keeping a very high bar. Okay, it's interesting because before you talked about technology and healthcare, which are typically, you know, the more expensive or more growthy industries. What trends are you seeing in terms of valuation multiples in private equity? Yes, I would say that the public market multiples have come down more meaningfully. Um, private markets valuations have remained quite sticky. And, you know, I think it's for two reasons. Um, number one, uh, you know, sponsors or general partners are still paying up for premium assets. So there has been a bit of a flight to quality. So, you know, I think they're more willing to pay for a market leading, scaled and dominant market leader. Uh, and one of the tools that you have in the toolkit is to you know, pay a full multiple, but blend down the entry price by doing these tuck-in accretive acquisitions during the investment holding period. Uh, and I would say a more nuanced reason behind you know, some of these valuations holding up strong in the private market space has got to do with a bit of spread. Right? As, you know, taking 2023 as an example, um, there have been a lot of sellers uh, who still expect uh, buyers to pay uh, multiples that were reflective of 2021 time periods and as a result they choose not to transact right so those transactions did not happen uh, but we do believe that as the bid ask spread narrows as sellers come back to the table uh, we do see you know hopefully would see some further normalization but you know in this in this current market environment i would say that you know market leading premium assets still command um, a full valuation what would a catalyst be for sellers to come back to the table yeah, I would see it in, you know, from two different angles. Um, I think if we look at the private equity seller, so a private equity fund that has a portfolio of companies, uh, they're managing the, these vehicles that have, have a finite sort of fund life. So if a vehicle comes to the end of its fund life, I think that's a good catalyst for a sponsor to come to the table as a seller and divest those assets. So that is one key catalyst. Um, the second angle that I see this from is from a company's perspective. Uh, I guess as we navigate a high inflation, you know, more uncertain uh, macro environment, uh, some of these corporates might have to divest non-core assets or non-core subsidiaries. And that's when you know, they, they would come back to the table um, because those divestments need to be made and they need to free up cash uh, to fund other parts of the business. So I would see these as you know, two broad catalysts um, for sellers to come back to the table. And hopefully you know, um, there could be a meeting of minds um, on, on the valuation. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today, Gabriel. It was awesome to have you on the pitch. Likewise, thank you for, ha thank you for having me. If you enjoyed that too, don't forget to subscribe to LiveWire's YouTube channel. We're adding so much great content just like this every single week.